Hi guys, it's been a while since I last filmed the video, but most of the time it was just too hot in my flat to even just think about sitting down and filming a video. So in order to get back into the swing of things, I thought I'd film a fun tag video today. And of course, at this time of year, it was always going to be the mid-year book freak out tag. Yay! There were 13 questions in this tag, so without further ado, I'm going to go right into it. Question number one is the best book that you've read so far this year. And that is a book that I haven't talked about on this channel yet, because I've only read it this month, two weekends ago, I think. And that is a novella by the Chilean author Pedro Lemebel which is called Tengo Miedo Torero in Spanish and in the English translation it is My Tender Matador. And it's an older one, it's from the early 90s, but it seems to be having a little comeback lately. At least I've seen it here and there on the book internet, but it hasn't yet risen to real booktube fame. The first time I saw it was at the beginning of the year on Roxy's channel from um, the Chaotic Bibliophile, and she is from Chile. And I've been looking for a copy of the Spanish version ever since, but I couldn't find a physical copy and it's only been available on Kindle in Spanish in Germany um, for a couple of weeks now. So when I saw that it was available again, I jumped onto it and it was every bit as good as I hoped it would be. It's set in 1986 and in the context of a student uprising against the dictatorship and a failed assassination attempt against Pinochet. And it's the story of an aging queen who falls in love with a student who uses her house as a gathering point and um, as a storehouse for weapons. And at this point here for this tag, I'm not even going to try and summarize in one or two sentences what it is that is so great about the book. You will have to watch my next wrap up for this, I'm afraid. Next question is the best sequel that you've read so far this year and I haven't read any super great sequels I'm afraid or very many sequels to begin with. The only real one that I've read is The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow, which is the sequel to The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. But I didn't think that this was a super good book. I enjoyed it, but I didn't think it was very good. So I can't name this as the best sequel. Well, I could because it's the only one. Um, but I have read a couple of crime series or the, begin the beginnings of a couple of crime series. The LA After Midnight Quartet, which I talked about in my last wrap up and the Henry Rios Mysteries. And these last ones in particular are very good. It's a series about a, um, a gay Mexican American defense lawyer in San Francisco and the Bay Area and in Los Angeles, the location changes in the course of the series. And the books are set and were written in the 80s and early 90s. And, and they are about all kinds of social issues that you can imagine that the protagonist is confronted with or witnesses in his particular section of the Venn diagram. Question number three asks for a new release that I haven't read yet but want to, and that would be Maggie Steve Harter's Mr. Impossible, which is the second book in the Dreamer trilogy, which is a spin off of The Raven Cycle. And I can't really tell you what this is about without spoiling The Raven Cycle, so I won't say anything. And perhaps this is the best sequel that I should have read in the first half of the year. But in my defense, it was only published at the end of May, so that's a valid excuse, I think. Question number four is most anticipated release for the second half of the year. And I have a few. The first one, whose publication date is coming up, in a couple of weeks is The Sweetness of Water by Nathan Harris, which is a historical novel about two freedmen in the aftermath of the Civil War. And that is 
about as much as I know about this book. And then there is Harlem Shuffle by Colts and Whitehead, which is out in early September, I think. And this one's just a given for me. I think Colts and Whitehead is an autobi author for me at this point. And then there is also Summer Suns by Lee Mandelo um, from Tor.com Publishing out in late September. And I think this is Dark Academia, which isn't usually my thing, but it sounds like a fun one. And it's Tor.com Publishing, so there is fantasy or spec fic elements mixed in there and it just sounds like a lot of fun so i'm looking forward to that one too question number five is the biggest disappointment and let me tell you i've read a lot of bad books these past six months like i always do but for most of them, I didn't have any huge expectations to begin with, so I can't really call them disappointments. Um, but one disappointment that stands out was Exposure by Helen Dunmore, which is a spy thriller, although it's not very thrilling. And it was just full of cliched cardboard characters and I was so disappointed by that because I read and loved The Lie by Helen Dunmore at the beginning of last year and if Exposure had been even just a fraction of the quality of The Lie and, and the emotional rawness of The Lie it would have been fantastic so I was pretty much counting on it being a good read, but it was one of the worst reads of the year and I didn't even finish it. There was nothing in it that made me want to keep reading it. It was just so bland and uninspired. A huge disappointment. And then, of course, there was Lava Red, Feather Blue by Molly Ringel, which I'd been looking forward to reading for a few months before I picked it up. Um, but the writing in that one was just extremely basic, like high school level quality, but the contents were even worse. This is about um, a conflict between the human population of an island with the older native fairy population of an island. The island was populated by fairies which came in all shapes and sizes, animals, plants, um, and the, their island was colonized by the humans. What I did not know going into this was that it is actually set in our world and the island is a Pacific island. And for some reason, the depiction of the native population of a Pacific island as animal shaped kind of rubbed me the wrong way. I think we've had enough of the depiction of Pacific Islanders as animalistic in history, don't you think? So that was downright disgusting and definitely a huge disappointment. Number six is the biggest surprise and for that I would again name the Henry Rios mysteries because I went into them not expecting too much, but just a fun crime series. But I was pleasantly surprised by how realistic and gritty and raw and honest they are. And although they were written in the 80s and 90s, they, are, they seem very contemporary in the issues that they talk about, but also in their sensibilities. And the author has gone over them and rewritten, re-edited and republished them recently. So maybe that's why. <laughs> And I would also name The Bedlam Stacks by Natasha Pulley, which was the first novel by Natasha Pulley that I read. And I was so surprised, pleasantly surprised, by how it is so equal parts magical and understated. And there were also so many moments and so many dialogues that made me nod along and say yes yes exactly um, this is a historical novel with fantastical elements set in Peru and like I said absolutely magical 
would recommend it to anybody who has an interest in historical novels or in the setting. And um, the year is, or the decade is the 1880s, I think. 1890s, 1880s, thereabouts. And speaking of Natasha Pulley, the seventh question is uh, your favorite new author. And I read all of her books, all of her novels this year, um, The Bedlam Sticks and The Watchmaker of Filigree Street and its sequel, The Lost Future of Pepper Harrow, and the newest one, The Kingdoms. And I've found a lot to criticize with these books. I haven't even talked about the Watchmaker novels yet, but I will at some point. And the Bedlam Stacks almost made me angry because it could have been perfect if not for one small thing that nevertheless I think weighs quite heavily. And so she drives me crazy, but I also love her books and especially her characters. And on the topic of characters, the eighth question is newest fictional crush. And I don't think I've had any so far this year because the only ones that had potential to become a, a crush of mine were, I, I very much perceived them as part of a couple and I was kind of in love with them as a couple, but not so much them on their own. And by far the best couple, I think, is Nathaniel and Maury in The Watchmaker of Filigree Street. And that is a good segue into question nine, which is um, who is my new favorite character? And that would be Nathaniel. Daniel Steepleton from The Watchmaker of Filigree Street and its sequel, of course. And that is because he, like most of Natasha Police characters, has such a refreshingly different idiosyncratic way of looking at the world and talking about the world, but one that, that doesn't feel forced, it never feels over the top, it always feels natural. And that is the thing I love most about Natasha Police books, her peculiar character voices and her very quiet, understated, but nevertheless extremely original characters. And that is also the reason why I like The Kingdom's least of all her novels, because there is so much going on in here that we don't get these quiet introspective character moments as much. And that is a real shame because I love those so much in the other novels. Question number 10 is a book that made you cry. I cry very easily these days, but I haven't read that many books that made me cry this year. I think the books that make me cry the most and the most frequently are romance novels and I haven't read many of those this year. I'm, I, f I feel like I'm getting back into a romance phase. Sorry if that's not your thing. Um, but the ones that did make me cry were those two even, yes, The Kingdoms, even though it's my least favorite one of Natasha Polley's novels, even that one made me cry. And then there is The Stones Cry Out, which I've read this month as well, so I haven't talked about it in the wrap-up yet. Um, this is set in the aftermath of World War II, and it is about the long-term effects that the war and the experiences in the war have on on a soldier and ultimately on his family. It's, it's really heartbreaking and I'm looking forward to talking about it in my next wrap-up. And there is also The Gift of Rain by Tan Chuan Eng, which is the story of a young Chinese-English boy who lived through the Japanese occupation of Malaya and who loses everyone and almost everything that he has ever held dear, which is not a spoiler because this has a frame narrative in which the 
aged protagonist um, tells his life story to a visitor. So we know from the beginning that he is all alone and that he has lost all the people that he's loved in his life. So this is from the get-go extremely melancholy and sad and nostalgic and uh, I love both of Chan, Chan Chuan Eng's novels, as you will know if you've watched my special review video of these novels. Question number 11 is a book that made you happy, and for that I would again name Tengo Miedo Torero by Pedro Lemebel, which was also my best book of the year. For one, because I just love it when authors have such a masterful grasp of language and can play so masterfully with language. I'm going to talk about that more in my wrap-up. And also because it is a tale of defiant happiness in the face of oppression, abuse, misery and bad fate. And it's about happiness as an act of defiance maybe and i like that a lot question number 12 is most beautiful book that you've bought this year and i haven't bought any spectacularly beautiful hardcover editions or anything and most of the books that i bought this year have been used books too um but i think that this edition of the tale of genji is very prettily done even though it's just a paperback edition and it's even a, a battered old one that i got used i don't even want to know what this edition costs if it's new and it also has um it's full of illustrations on every other page just not the ones that i um but this is um these are wood prints reproductions of wood prints from an edition from i think the 16th century the tale of genji itself is from the 11th century oh yeah the wood the wood cuts are taken from a 1650 japanese edition and just like i said i think the cover design is fine and the back cover are just very prettily done and makes it feel a bit like you are you're holding a codex in your hands and the 13th and last question is what books do you need to read by the end of the year and as you know i don't have a strict tbr or a book bucket list or any kind of expectations for myself really when it comes to reading but I do want to read more recent releases. I've only read, I think, five 2021 releases so far. So ideally, I would like to get to all three books that are mentioned in the question of what upcoming releases are you most looking forward to. I'd like to have read them all by the end of the year. So that would be Harlem Shuffle by Colts and Whitehead, um, the Sweetness of Water by Nathan Harris and Summer Suns by Lee Mandelo. Mandelo? I, I always want to say Mandelo because as a German that immediately makes me think of Mandelo, which if you are German you know what I'm talking about and if you aren't, never mind. But yeah, Summer Suns by Lee Mandelo and of course Mr. Impossible by Maggie Stiefvater, which has been my upcoming next read for about a month now. So these four plus all of them really, <laughs> I want to have read all of the books that I want to read and ideally I would like to get my physical TBR down to at least under a hundred, preferably under 80, and I'd like for it to stay there. So that said, I should probably go and get reading, right? So this is the end of the video. I hope you've enjoyed this quick overview of 
my first half of 2021 in reading. I always love the mid-year book freakout tag and I love seeing people do it here but also on Instagram I've been enjoying these posts and stories as well and I hope you've been enjoying my little contribution. Until next time guys, bye!